Well, for more on the markets, we're joined by Ross Gerber, president and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management. Ross, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, the, the streak of gains that we've been seeing on U.S. markets, I mean, I, I suppose they eventually had to come to an end. Well, Powell, Powell wasn't going to let us have an update today. I mean, you know, he's just the Grinch that's trying to steal wealth from the rest of the world. <laughs> and, you know, so he talked down the market again. What, what a surprise. Yeah. Do you think that that was the, the sort of message that Powell was sending? Because it, markets were bracing for the possibility that uh, within the parade of uh, Fed speakers this week, including Powell, they were going to be getting that message that, in the next move for interest rates, like many are expecting, you know, isn't going to be a cut. Maybe it could be a hike and try to push back on that idea that the cut could be the next thing coming. Do you think that that he did that with his messaging today? <laughs> well, I, all he did was show everybody how clueless he is again. Like it's it's almost as like there's two sets of worlds, like the old data that the Fed uses and then the real-time data that the market participants actually use and, and actually, you know, leading indicators that we're looking at are quite worrisome. And so, you know, the, the fact that the Fed doesn't see what corporate America is doing, what's happening across, you know, employment, um, spending, you know, things are underlying very good in the United States right now. So to continue to create more uncertainty about rates when we all know that rates are going to be low or not higher next year. It, it just serves nobody's purpose. It just people just have no confidence in the Fed at all. Well, it, it does sound like they're, you know, looking at data outside of what they would have traditionally been looking at. I mean, he was talking about that in his speech yesterday, that you need needing to think outside the box in these times where, you know, there's a, a lot to consider. Um, but beyond the, uh, you know, the, the monetary policy side of things, there's a lot else to be watching for that's happening in the markets these days, uh, including this earnings season that we're, we're still having some uh, companies reporting. Disney was after the bell yesterday, but seeing a reaction uh, in the stock today. Um, what, what do you make of Disney and Bob Iger's return to Disney, what he's been doing so far, plans for more uh, cost cutting? What do you make of it? Well, I'm a long-term Disney shareholder, so I've you know been through lots of ups and downs with Disney, and this has been a particularly dismal stretch, which was really started because Iger promoted JPEG, and JPEG did a horrible job, and then he replaced him with himself again. So, you know, if you look at what Disney's done since Iger's return and where it's at today, I was very pleased with the results because what we saw was a combination of things working. One, that cost cutting at Hulu and the and Disney Plus is starting to get the numbers more in line because we really need streaming to be a profitable business and we expect that over the next 12 months. Number two, they really clearly define a future for ESPN, not only with their deal with Penn Gaming to become a gambling app in the next week, but also just to look at partnerships and opportunities with the leagues and others that can really expand its to direct consumer opportunity for ESPN, which I think will be an amazingly successful sports app. And then, you know, obviously parks and resorts continues to just, you know, print money. And the weakness is really in the studios and, and content has been really weak for Disney, which is traditionally the leader in, in high quality content, especially for families. So Iger is really refocused on making good content, which is exactly what Disney needs, as well as lowering its costs. So those messages were sort of music to the ears on top of the fact that, you know, the Chinese, uh, you know, tourism and visitation is back, not only with Disney, but also in Macau. And that's been a huge boost to companies like Disney is getting, you know, Chinese consumers back at the park. I wonder what you're thinking about the EV space these days as well, because we've talked about Tesla before. Uh, we, we talked about Rivian earlier this week when it reported its latest results, and uh, it, it's expecting higher production than um, it previously estimated. It reported slightly higher revenue for the quarter, uh, but it, it does seem to be still a, a challenging space uh, that it's, you know, it's expensive to be building EVs. And as we've heard from Tesla CEO Elon Musk, uh, it's challenging for people to be able to afford them these days with interest rates as high as they are. So what are your thoughts around the EV space right now? I think that Elon is making an excuse for the fact that he doesn't, you know, he does a lot of things that hurts Tesla's image 
on a weekly basis. It hurts its core consumers. A report just came out that the biggest buyers of EVs in the United States are all, you know, blue states like California and Washington and such. And so, you know, Tesla's got an image problem and they're sort of extrapolating out that EVs are having this issue because Tesla is at least 50% of the EV mar market, but a lot of this is unique to Elon and Tesla. The, the truth is, is if a consumer is gonna buy a car, buying a gas car today is one of the most expensive things you could do because you're paying for gas, which is very expensive when electricity is extremely cheap. So I think that the EV business needs to advertise its value proposition. I've talked about this a lot. Really, Tesla needs to advertise its value proposition to consumers and educate consumers on the proposition of buying an EV because you got 20% of the people in California buying it and you got 0% of the people, let's say, in Texas buying it. And, and it's really just a lack of education. Who wants to pay $150 to fill up their their tank, but the cost of a Tesla today is forty thousand plus with benefits and, and tax, you know, incentives. It's it's is cheap or cheaper than the average car. Yeah, no, it it is interesting uh, when you're comparing the the cost of the two there. Just very quickly, uh, Ross, um, you're interested in a company called Train Technologies. They yes. make heat pumps, and I did think that that was interesting because there's been a lot of uh, discussion in Canada about switching to heat pumps instead yes. of heating oil. Um, so, what do you like about Train Technologies? Well, it started with Elon, you know, at the last meeting last year, talking about heat pumps for a long time and that Tesla's not in that business, but it actually is as important to climate as solving, you know, cars and that air conditioning units and heating units use, use a ton of natural gas and, and, and it's really bad, you know, for the environment in general. And if we could solve this, you know, this would be a huge impact. And that's when I started studying heat pumps, which are really air conditioning, heating units, they do both. Hmm. But what it turns out is technologies has gotten much better for heat pumps and they're able to cool homes like in Canada much better than in the past because obviously when you're burning gas, it's it's easier to, to cool a home quick, I mean, to heat a home quicker. But like with electricity, you can actually do this now because of technology much more efficiently, efficiently and, and cheaper and you're protecting the environment. So across the board now, um, so many people and in industries, you know, commercial buildings are moving to heat pump systems from traditional heating units, um, not only for the environment, but for cost savings. And I just put two in my house. And that was basically the experience I've had yeah. is they're wonderful units and they, you know, use electricity and I don't have to pay for national natural gas. And last year, the prices soared right. during winter. So I'm excited about this. 